Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. 52 Living Ideas is honored to have Mark Stallman and this and CSDL back for this series, launching preview. This is lecture number two, navigating paradigms. Over to you, Mark. Shrigan, I'm very excited uh, to be back again. Um, you've been very generous in your collaboration with us. I know you're very busy. Um, and uh, like most of us have had uh, health concerns. Uh, so your contribution to this is in enormously uh, valuable. And, and I, I really just want to emphasize uh, my thanks for you. Uh, and, and for uh, the audience, uh, more broadly, uh, as Srikant has indicated, this is a four lecture series inviting people to submit applications for uh, attending Trivium University, which is an experimental online digital school that will begin next year. I also want to thank our guests, who you will hear from after I finish going through my slides. Um, Adam Pugin uh, is a, a colleague and, and a close friend, uh, and uh, he will be uh, speaking about Diane Noeticon. And we're very uh, pleased that George Dyson uh, has found the time to join us today. Uh, George's most latest uh, book, Analogia, uh, continues the series. And he probably is, uh, well, in my mind, not probably, he certainly is the premier historian of technology. Uh, and uh, in, in particular, we very much uh, welcome and thank George for joining us. First slide, please. <clears throat> Actually, back to the title, if you don't mind. <clears throat> Excellent, thank you. Uh, this is probably the most difficult topic that we discuss. Paradigms. Not because it's such a um, bizarre topic. In fact, there are dozens, maybe scores of companies that named paradigms. Most people have read or are aware of uh, Thomas Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions. I was very uh, honored to be able to uh, have lunch uh, actually with George's uh, father, Freeman Dyson at Princeton. And a good deal of that conversation was actually about paradigms. Uh, the reason why this subject is so difficult and I'll just underscore the difficulty in this way. Um, formal causality must be understood to understand paradigms. But formal causality has largely been abandoned in our times. It is one of the four causes that Aristotle asserted. And in the passage in Aristotle's physics, where he specifically describes, introduces, uh, and elaborates on the four causes. In Greek, obviously, he describes formal cause as morphe and paradigma. So there are two modifiers that he uses. I've been through a dozen or more English language translations and not a single translator used the word paradigm. So there's something sticky uh, or tricky maybe <laughs> about this whole paradigm topic. Um, <clears throat> Technological determinism is a subject you may have heard of if you've gone through uh, social science uh, courses. Um, it is almost mandatory in today's uh, social science world, particularly papers that deal with related topics to what we're talking about, that the author has to denounce technological determinism. But it is technology that is behind these paradigm shifts. So that denunciation of technological determinism, which is not what we're talking about. So this is a, 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 a kind of a hijacking uh, of the whole term here. We're going to have to try to uh, elaborate. Uh, to be fair, as is true with most of the subjects we're talking about in these invitation lectures, uh, 
the, the full exposition will take more time. And so this is what Trivia University is really for. What we're talking about here are sensibilities. Sensibilities that are driven in human beings through the course of their development as they come to grips with the environment in which they live. And if the environment has changed, so will their development. They'll turn out with a different sensibility. Nowadays, I guess for obvious reasons, the counter to technological determinism, of course, is social constructionism. And most people today would like to believe that they are independent actors with a great deal of agency. Well, that is not quite true. And so coming to grips with the fact that psychotechological environments shape, not determine, our sensibilities becomes a stumbling block. So this is a hard subject, and I think we'll probably pick up some of that in the Q&A, and hopefully we'll have a chance um, beyond that to try to explore this. Next slide, please. There have been many transitions or paradigm shifts. The last of the four slides will in fact uh, lay them out. But the one that is most important since we are living through it today is the transition from an electric, technologically shaped paradigm to one that is being shaped by digital technology. Uh, one of uh, our colleagues at the uh, center uh, made a big deal of this, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that he will write an essay at some point. Uh, his name is Peter Berkman. Um, Peter's uh, assertion was that the distinction between electric and digital, which by the way, a lot of people who study these subjects have not made this distinction. So while the material that we're dealing with is available to everyone, uh, the metaphorical and analogical connections between them have to be generated anew, endlessly. And so the electric paradigm, starting in the 19th century, largely with telegraph. So um, I'm sure many of you remember uh, what is often billed as the, the first uh, major uh, telegraph message, what hath God wrought. Uh, uh, this was uh, uh, in the 1840s uh, from Baltimore to Washington. Um, and uh, uh, radio, of course, is, uh, is something we're familiar with, um, probably primarily through our parents' or grandparents' sensibilities, which were very different from ours. And then the television world in which we've been living. That's the electric paradigm uh, lasting roughly 150 years, mid 19th century till around uh, 2000. To be fair, paradigms are not black and white, despite the uh, slide or screen behind me, um, but they are big. And so I've picked a, a big version of the word paradigm, uh, but there are lots of overlaps. There are lots of ways in which these things blend into each other. Uh, and that's the reason why analogical thinking is necessary, which is another stumbling block. But as everybody here knows, we have been asked uh, to suspend our disbelief when we're looking at a movie screen, looking at a television screen, and we're now being asked, in fact, uh, to enter into a completely virtual world. This is the reason why Meta, used to be Facebook, is literally spending billions of dollars to try to entice us into a virtual reality. That is the electric paradigm, not the digital paradigm. The electric paradigm began literally with seances in the 19th century. Late 19th century, seances were extremely uh, popular um, all the way, uh, in fact, to the, to the highest uh, or at least richest uh, levels of society. Very common on weekends for carriages to be carrying people uh, from one end of Manhattan to the other to participate in seances. The seances then uh, shifted into what became known as psychological warfare, particularly in World War I. Propaganda uh, was the basis of that. There's a great deal of important literature, particularly Jacques Ellul on the top propaganda. 
But then propaganda proved to not be as effective and it was replaced by memes. So we, we've all wrestled with the topic of memes and we know that they are fantastic. We know that they're not supposed to be questioned. We know that they are fantasy. And that is the, the core, the sensibility associated with the electric paradigm. There's an important quote here that I uh, put in. There's a deep seated repugnance against understanding the processes in which we're involved. This was a letter from Marshall McLuhan to Jacques Maritain in 1969. The reason for that repugnance, he goes on to say, is because if we actually understood these processes, then we would have to take responsibility for our own actions. In sharp distinction to the fantasy-based electric paradigm we're all too familiar with, we have moved into, we typically date this around the year 2000, doesn't mean that it's evident to everybody. In fact, as McLuhan suggested, new environments or new ground tends to be quite invisible. And we're in that in-between twilight zone right now where the new ground of digital has adopted the old ground uh, of, of fantasy as its content. And so things are quite mixed up. Uh, the point that I wanna emphasize throughout here, and the McLuhan uh, quote is critical in this regard, is that we have to get away from that electric paradigm in order to take responsibility for our actions. That is to say, to understand the processes in which we're involved requires a whole different sensibility. And that sensibility is fundamental uh, to taking responsibility, which is a very key notion of what we're emphasizing at Trivue. Next slide, please. Now here we're dealing with a, a topic that is um, going to stretch what people are uh, comfortable with, I'm sure. Uh, McLuhan is a touchstone for much of the way we understand and discuss these topics. And in particular, the tetrad of enhance, obsolesce, retrieve, and flip uh, treats all four of those quadrants as simultaneous, as all contributing, much as all Aristotle's four causes contribute. Uh, but it turns out that the retrieve quadrant is in many ways, the key to the whole tetrad heuristic. So what McLuhan suggested, what we've all experienced under electric conditions with the retrieval of the pre-literate is that that then leads into a flip into post-literacy, which is a common description uh, of the life that we are now living and underneath that, uh, the occult. That retrieval is not what digital does to us. In fact, digital retrieves something quite different. It retrieves the scribal literate sensibility and memory along with it. And I don't know if, if Bill Fresno has had a chance to join us yet, uh, but uh, Bill has uh, uh, a passion for history and he has just crossed a critical threshold literally in the last couple of days. I hope he doesn't mind that I mentioned this. He's been describing it publicly on his own list. He has jumped from reading electric authors, uh, that's to say uh, people who have been writing history over the course of the past 50 years or so, to the original sources. So Bill has actually made this paradigm shift in his own sensibility from people uh, who are describing uh, once or twice removed to the people uh, who were there uh, at the time. Uh, and this has uh, 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 blown his mind to be able to go back and read 
scribal history, um, obviously in translation, or, uh, and in fact, an audio book in this case, uh, but uh, uh, it's a major difference in sensibility. A part of this will be for all of us, and it's already begun in China, uh, a return to the classics. Uh, we are going to do Q&A uh, uh, by Adam, so that uh, Adam's questioning here. So uh, I don't know how deeply we'll be able to get into that, uh, given the, the one hour time limit we set for ourselves, but um, we will find other venues uh, to continue these discussions. The Chinese have already, uh, from the top of the society, so what just happened over the course of the past week was the 20th Party Congress. <clears throat> These happen uh, every five years. So the Communist Party of China has been around for a hundred years. Uh, and one of the key events that has happened over the course of the past few years in China is a very deliberate retrieval of the classics. So this is scribal sensibility, not a later sensibility. And in China, this actually goes a, a step beyond what you would have expected there are a number of uh, Chinese classics, which are being taught literally from the standing committee of the Politburo. If you've been following the news, you will know that there have been uh, a few changes in the uh, central committee and the Politburo. Uh, they're all studying Chinese classics, but it goes beyond that. China has actually recently retranslated Aristotle China has taken credit, as they tend to do, for the Western classics as a result of a Chinese diaspora uh, beginning largely in the, uh, the period <clears throat> when China was united. And we probably have all heard the story, which is dubious, um, that uh, the emperor demanded the burning of all the books and, and the uh, killing of all the scholars. Uh, that's not quite what happened, but uh, the Chinese think that a lot of the Western classics uh, in fact have a Chinese uh, origin. So the, the analogy that I would draw here is that the transition out of an oral paradigm into a scribal paradigm <clears throat> has parallels to what we're doing now. The axial age is the term that Carl Jaspers first suggested. Many others have followed forward on this, roughly around 500 BC as the time period uh, in which that transition was um, beginning to occur. It stretched out certainly over a great deal of time. So as I emphasized last week, these shifts are happening not only with a shorter duration between the shifts, but a very compressed time in which the shift occurs. And this is a part of the reason why this topic is so difficult. In a certain sense, electricity retrieved a pagan past. So it is typically referred to as secular, uh, typically referred to in relationship to the enlightenment, not exactly true. In fact, there's a great deal of the occult and a great deal of what would have uh, passed in a sense uh, in an earlier pagan era. That is now being seriously challenged. So I, I want to make it clear here that these ideas that we're talking about are not uh, innocent. These ideas we're talking about are not um, safe. In fact, they're fraught with danger. Uh, the shift that is now underway um, is one uh, of uh, a, a colossal uh, increase in conflicts. We see it in every part of our lives. We can try to explain it in any number of ways. Uh, but in fact, uh, it is this paradigm shift from electric to digital that underlies uh, what superficially uh, may look like uh, simply a new era. McKinsey Global Institute, for instance, instance uh, just released a, a long document 
about the new era that we are in, but it's just skims the surface. What we are trying to do consistently here is to go beneath the surface to try to understand the patterns of the ground shifts that are underway. Next slide, please. So how have our perceptions changed? Well, uh, Adam will talk about this a bit when, when he uh, gets teed up, uh, but uh, the notion that we are five outer senses just pass through in a direct fashion and ultimately impinge upon our intelligence is clearly false. And yet that is, the if you're going to model a human being on a computer, a computer just simply has uh, input, uh, ultimately output, but there is nothing in the middle of the sandwich, so to speak. It is our conviction that it is the meat in the center of the sandwich, which we have termed the inner senses. This is not something that is, uh, uh, widely understood today, but will need to be. And we've done a great deal of work about this. These in fact should be referred to as the faculties of the soul. The soul is the form of a living creature uh, in Greek, because we're back to Aristotle here. The term for what we call in English soul uh, is psyche. That term in Latin is anima, the basis of animation. So we're going to have to retrieve an understanding of the faculties of the soul. The, the way that Roger Penrose, who has been around for a long time, he's a very well-known uh, Oxford intellectual, I've only recently uh, begun to dig in on him, but he has written multiple books on how the brain cannot be a computer, therefore um, uh, invalidating. Uh, most of, of current uh, academic uh, psychology, cognitive psychology, is that there needs to be at least three steps. Awareness, that would be the outer senses. Then an understanding process, which he quite frankly says, I've listened to a number of, of interesting interviews with him. He, he doesn't exactly know how to explain what understanding is, but he knows it's different from awareness and different from intelligence. Well, it is that understanding part. It is the how, how do we put these connections together that winds up uh, becoming, if you will, the key to the entire process. It is in that realm that digital enhances, it doesn't require us, it doesn't determine us, we're not robots, but it enhances the uh, sense of memory we have because that is the internal architecture, in fact, of digital systems. And that shift from fantasy to memory, which is occurring in the inner senses, not comprehended by current academic cognitive psychology, that corresponds, I believe, to Penrose's understanding. We have forgotten our understanding of structures and causes. This is not something that the center uh, has pioneered in, in any sense. In fact, there's a vast literature that now needs to be retrieved. But the uh, understanding of these structures and causes is really the failure of this whole artificial general intelligence uh, effort. So I don't know uh, how closely people follow uh, AGI research. Obviously, AGI uh, is uh, the uh, effort uh, to uh, surpass uh, human capabilities going well beyond uh, today's machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence uh, systems, chatbots, and so forth. Uh, Roger Penrose, as I noted, has written a, a, over the series of many decades, and so I would point you to his work. But more recently, I'll also point you to the work of a, a very well-known character in the AGI research. And in fact, he has started multiple organizations, newsletters, conferences, and so forth, Ben Gertzel. So in, in July of this year, a couple months ago, 
Ben put out a paper in which he basically said, we're never get, going to get there. The approach that we're taking to this is not going to make it happen. He suggested three alternative paths to take. And I am today suggesting that those won't work either. He's looking for a new form of algorithmic attack. Not going to work. He's looking for mimicking the biology associated with this. That's a very interesting idea. However, he doesn't understand the biology that's involved, in particular human biology. The third is actually a chemical approach to this, trying to see if we can come up with some new chemicals to help us. But he's not the only one. The head of AI research at Meta, whose name is Jan LeCun, uh, uh, he's a Frenchman, so the N is probably not pronounced diagonally, <laughs> Le Coup. Uh, he has, uh, even more recently, come out and said publicly that all of this money, and there's billions and billions of dollars being spent on this effort, cannot possibly succeed. And interestingly, uh, Jan Le Coup has come up with his version of faculties. So. As you see on this slide, the bullet point above, faculties of the soul, we now have the head of artificial intelligence research at Meta, unaware of the fact that this is a topic that had been discovered a long time ago, uh, research discussed at great length across multiple civilizations. Uh, he is trying to reinvent all of that. That's also likely not to work. Um, instead, it is our view at the center that we must recover an understanding of what it means to be human, and in particular, how to operate economically and politically at human scale. And we also are quite confident that new sciences, likely derived, particularly in the West, on a natural law tradition, will be required uh, for us to make these breakthroughs. Last slide, please. So here I will um, skip over this uh, fairly quickly. I have just uh, pulled a few terms um, to refer to the five primary paradigms. Uh, the uh, oral paradigm uh, has, uh, of course, uh, no history because people weren't writing. So we don't really know when that began. <laughs> Uh, some have suggested the answer to that is 50,000 years ago. Uh, Noam Chomsky in particular, I think, has put forward the view, as have others, that the uh, origin of oral language in Homo sapiens, who have been around for hundreds of thousands of years, probably was not there in the beginning. So he has suggested that mutations may have been needed to start the oral paradigm. Uh, that is a, a very interesting topic, but it is um, uh, mostly speculative. Um, what we know about the oral period um, is really what we have retrieved. And we've retrieved the pre-literate aspects, transforming into post-literate. And the role of mythology in the 20th century is phenomenal. Um, I will just simply here underscore for you uh, uh, many commentators on the, the role of mythology and uh, how that was elevated. Um, uh, Joseph Campbell uh, is an obvious uh, touchstone for this, as is Carl Jung. And in many ways, um, perhaps also Jordan Peterson was a follower of Carl Jung, retrieving the oral paradigm. The oral paradigm was superseded by a scribal paradigm. This is where the classics uh, come in. Um, it's literate and critically it's self-aware. So I will just note here for you that among uh, various things that, that I've uh, traveled to participate in, I was um, literally the last student for a um, one-time Princeton psychologist by the name of Julian James. James uh, published only one book, The Origins of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. 
Um, but uh, Jane's uh, is not the only one who became fascinated with this mythological transformation. My godfather, uh, Norbert Wiener, uh, and his uh, friend, my other godfather, Giorgio Saniana, a historian of science, uh, published a fascinating book called Hamlet's Mill, suggesting that pre-literate, uh, I think George just raised his eyebrows at, at Hamlet's Mill, that's a somewhat controversial uh, book. Uh, maybe he'll have some comments about that. Uh, that in turn was superseded by the print paradigm, very mechanical, a clockwork world. Descartes, of course, is closely associated with this, but so should be Spinoza and so forth. That then transitioned into an electric paradigm. The, these dates are all approximate. The terms that I've used here of quantum and post-literate, uh, uh, they're probably better ones to use, but those are a couple um, in the word cloud for the electric world. But in the digital world in which we now uh, live, we're now dealing with radical autonomy. We are racing uh, as fast as we possibly can to try to build machines who can operate autonomously. So my guess is a few folks on this call and others who will listen to it own Tesla automobiles. So as, as you all know, it is the uh, FSD option that gets a great deal of publicity. That's full self-driving. That is autonomous machines uh, carrying humans around. And here um, we are suggesting that autonomy should be our goal because it is the path to responsibility. Uh, more uh, will be said in the following two lectures about all of these subjects. I apologize for skipping uh, stones across the surface of the lake here. Uh, I'll draw your attention uh, to uh, Marshall and Eric McLuhan's 1988 Laws of Media, The New Science, uh, as a, uh, a, a key work in uh, substantiating the framework we're talking about here. And now I'd like to actually to uh, uh, pass uh, it along uh, to George Dyson. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. And we're here really thanks to Mark, the Center for the Study of Digital Life, and, and Fred, the uh, comes from the tradition of great books. So I have a lot of great books on my shelf. I just picked one out that that is, I think, particularly emblematic of where we are. It's it's the Rand Corporation's a million random digits with 100,000 normal deviates. So this comes from a very <laughs> important paradigm shifting uh, time when at Rand, at the Rand Corporation, they had the first really fully deterministic digital computer that was the only computer built with the RCA Selectron memory that had 100,000 hours average mean time between failure, completely unlike the, the vacuum tube computers of the time. And so what became clear was that if you had these deterministic machines, you suddenly had a great shortage. What you really needed were random numbers. So there was a, there was a, a real crisis, scarcity of random numbers. And I'm not going to go into this in any depth, except to, to point out the uh, the footnote in the introduction, because of the very nature of the tables, it did not seem necessary to proofread every page of the final manuscript in order to catch <laughs> random errors. And and so this is important to us. This is really what brings us here, because the one of the people behind this project at RAND was Andrew Marshall, who's sort of the, uh, I mean, Mark already explained it. Norbert Wiener was his godfather, but the, the grandfather is Andrew Marshall, who, who had an eye for these paradigm shifts. And in a, in a way, the, the Center for the Study of Digital Life is a direct outgrowth of Andy Marshall's program within the American Department of Defense. And so another person at Rand was Herman Kahn, who 
who came to the sort of second conference on random numbers and and made the comment that in, in Monte Carlo, if a Monte Carlo technician wanted a green-eyed pig with curly hair and six toes, and this event had a non-zero probability, then unlike the agriculturist, he could immediately produce the animal. And that's the, the key shift that we, we thought in the classical times that if we had if we had full determinism, everything would be predictable. And we now have to face the reality that you actually can have a fully deterministic uh, digital universe, but that doesn't mean it's predictable. And that's the struggle. That's the problem with the with politics right now that we can uh, you know, we we can predict how people are going to vote more accurately than uh, with better technology than we can count how they voted. Uh, I thank Mark for for being one of the few people who understands that the real meaning of analog that that, that you know it, my book Analogia is not uh, about analog in what the sense that most people think it is. It's something completely different. It's analog in the definition of sort of non logical, and I am particularly obsessed with that. I think that that's probably the reason I'm here as the, the jester that I think we are in a equally important paradigm shift right now where we're going from the digital to the analog in a technical way that using these digital systems that are now ubiquitous we are building analog systems systems that work in a fundamentally non-logical non-deterministic uh, frequency coded way and that is very profound profound and that's some of the problems that we're seeing in the world that we haven't come, we haven't really realized that yet. So to take it back um, 75 years ago, Alan Turing made the statement to the London Mathematical Society that that being digital should be of more interest than being electronic. And I think now we're we we've had 75 years of that. Now we need to realize that being electronic is actually more interesting than uh, being digital. To bring it back to to leave you with the sort of political struggle we're in today my last conversation with Larry Page one of the founders of Google he made the statement or asked the question the the question went around the room sort of what what's what's your question and his question was if i was an ai what would i want government to be and we we live in that world and that's the big question before us Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, Adam Pugin uh, is a, a close colleague. Um, take it away, Adam. Yeah, hi, hey, everybody. Uh, very good to be here. Um, and so, yeah, I've been uh, working with Mark um, for quite a while. And um, one of the, um, uh, you know, really important things we've worked on is um, this journal that uh, the Center for the City of Detroit started up. Um, uh, Mark, uh, Peter Bergman, and, and myself um, edited this first issue. And um, so, yeah, maybe I'll just talk a little bit about that or point you all um, to the website where you can um, look at that issue. Um, it's um, digitallife.center. Um, and uh, what's interesting there, and we're going to uh, continue these journal issues, um, which will be, um, uh, you know, maybe a kind of written form or in-depth um, formal, you know, medium um, that will run alongside um, Trivium University. Um, but in this first issue, um, it, um, it's, it's quite nice and I think um, really goes deeply in, into a lot of things that Mark was saying today. Um, in the sense of, um, well, the inner senses, that that's what the issue uh, is called. And um, the inner senses, um, understanding them in terms of um, the faculties of the soul that Mark was talking about, say, you know, the inner senses, you know, technically existing, you know, in human psychology, kind of between the external senses and the intellect. Um, and so it's kind of this missing element in human perception that um, modern science and philosophy has not really um, has not really you know promoted and, and understood. And, and our thesis is that um, because they have not done that, then you know we have we have 
um, not really understood, um, you know, human autonomy, human freedom in the way that it was in more, you could say, humanistic times um, before that clockwork universe um, that, that Mark was talking about. Um, and so, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's really um, all I will say there and uh, leave more room for questions. But yeah, I would definitely recommend um, um, all of you to check that out for a more in-depth um, understanding of our approach on, you know, what are the faculties of the human soul and, and how that um, relates to, you know, retrieving this notion of human autonomy um, in distinction to this technological determinism. Um, thank you, Adam. And, and I'll, I'll just, uh, as, as people are submitting their questions, Srikant's about to uh, uh, collate and, and pose uh, some questions. So we succeeded in leaving 15 minutes, which, which was the goal for that. So as you're uh, compiling and, and sending um, questions to Srikant, um, a lot of them, uh, a lot of items are already in chat here. Uh, I, I just uh, want to note for for you, going back to what George has said here, um, uh, the analogia um, analog that George is talking about and credits that uh, with his interest in the rest of our work. This is this is what uh, historically would have been called analogy. And the distinction between analogy and logic is the distinction between grammar, which is analogia, and dialectics, which is logic. Needless to say, that is the structure of the trivium. So trivium university is exactly on the subject of how is it that we can put both analogy and logic to work under these new circumstances. So thank you, George, and, and also um, thank you very much, Adam. Trikan. Uh, folks, um, let's focus on general questions about paradigms. So I'm, I'm going to put a question on the table, which actually highlights the question of the change to digital paradigm. Mark, what is Facebook in terms of electric and digital and uh, in terms of transition between the paradigms? Go ahead. Right. One of the more um, uh, difficult notions that Marshall McLuhan put forward, something which he claims to have discovered uh, in the late 1950s is that in this transition from one environment to another, there is a strange relationship in human psychology between the old and the new. The old persists, but it gets weaker and weaker. And as it gets weaker and weaker, it becomes more and more frantic. And so there is this sense of uh, inevitable loss on the part of the old paradigm. So it fights to hold on. And uh, slowly, although with current circumstances, everything's moving more rapidly, the new paradigm asserts itself. And, and in this case, um, the fourth lecture in these series will discuss at some length what we're calling the digital sphere. And so it, to a certain extent, um, we are already in a world where people have taken this, uh, as George has suggested, uh, many steps further along than might be expected. Uh, and so Facebook is both electric and digital. The grammar of Facebook at a certain level is obviously digital, it is memory. Um, everything you posted on Facebook can be remembered. You can download your entire history and so forth. Um, you can search uh, Facebook. That, those are digital qualities. But at the same time, because it's an advertising supported business, we have all turned into broadcasters. So it is effectively television inside a digital structure. So the answer, uh, Srikant, is it's a transitional form and that uh, effort on the part of uh, Meta, uh, which uh, I think is likely uh, to fail, uh, is an inevitable uh, um, next step. They really have no choice but to double down on fantasy. 
but that is not where we're heading. Wonderful. Uh, Max has a couple of really interesting questions. How does how does mathematics changed with paradigm? Do, do mm -hmm. these different mm -hmm. paradigms have different mathematics associated with it? And do they have different law associated mm -hmm. it? So how does mathematics and law change with paradigms? Um, there are some mathematicians, I suspect, uh, on this call. I am not one of them. Uh, when the choice uh, came to me as to what I should major in, the choice was between physics and biology at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Graduated there in 1970. So uh, George will be familiar with the kind of framework that was going on and, and the intellectual um, contests. I chose biology. And I specifically chose biology because, as far as I can tell to this date, attempts to mathematize biology have all failed. Um, and in order to consider organic systems to be systems, so I just contra I just I just did the uh, oxymoron in my in my language subconsciously here. Is it possible for there to be an organic system? Can you be systematic with the mathematics associated with it? Uh, and uh, and so I I think uh, Max. This question is probably a deeper one than I can answer adequately, um, and one that deserves a much more attention. But uh, let me just note for you, mathematics tends to be resorted to when the, um, the fact that language becomes very difficult to strike uh, univocal definitions. And so when the meaning of terms change. And uh, there's a, a marvelous list of these I compiled at one point. Um, uh, for instance, um, uh, the whole meaning of, uh, of what a fact is. Uh, facts at one point in a scribal era uh, meant uh, something very close to a deed. So we say in fact and we say indeed. Um, in English, and, and sometimes they're interchangeable. Uh, but they diverged with the print paradigm. And the fact, and, and there's uh, interesting literature on this, the fact became an entry in a ledger book. So accounting and uh, the rise of, of commercial enterprises and so forth forced a change in the language. So uh, my inadequate answer uh, to your interesting question is uh, we need to recognize that the uh, lack of single univocal meanings inevitably changed dramatically with paradigm shifts. My guess is that the implication of that is a change in the underlying univocal mathematics associated with it. And I'll, I'll just finish by saying that um, physics, uh, the, the field that I did not choose, um, is going to need to be radically revised. This isn't just the dead end and string theory as reflected in the television show and Sheldon Cooper's problems with string theory on the Big Bang. Um, it is uh, quite evident, I think, to many people who were involved with this. Um, uh, Penrose here again is the touchstone. So not only is Penrose made of himself uh, an annoyance uh, or worse uh, with his declaration that the brain cannot be a computer, um, he probably has done a number of other things. The one that I noticed is that he's involved with some folks who have posited that there is something in quotes, before the Big Bang. And furthermore, uh, it is now being asserted that uh, the uh, Hubble telescope and uh, its replacement in James Webb are beginning to produce uh, significant uh, anomalies in terms of size, distribution of galaxies, in terms of gravitational wave detection, it cannot be explained by the theory 
So it, it um, I may be overdoing this. Uh, George uh, probably knows far more about it than I do. Uh, but the, 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 the sense that a new paradigm is upon us, as uh, Thomas Kuhn described in the structure of scientific revolutions, it feels to me like we're approaching that. Social science tends to be the area that I focus on more, but my bet is that the same thing is happening in physics, it's happening in chemistry, it's happening all across the board, that people are running into um, very serious experimental problems. They're coming up with results that seriously challenge the, the underlying uh, theories. So a language to, and in particular, a mathematical language that is appropriate to that kind of a scientific revolution, I think is a very uh, interesting topic to explore. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, following up on the question of law, how, how does law change from paradigm to paradigm? Right. Um, I have actually had a chance to have conversations uh, with a fair number of lawyers on just this subject. Uh, Debbie Newman uh, is a lawyer, and uh, she's been involved in a few of those conversations as well. And it turns out that today's lawyers, um, at least those that I've been able to discuss this with, have reported that they are told very early in law school that there is no natural law, that law is completely socially constructed. So we're back to the question of, of uh, determinism and, and social construction. In other words, it's all man-made, made up. I don't think that's likely to survive this paradigm shift. There's a vast literature on the topic of natural law under electric conditions. There's a much vaster literature under scribal conditions. I suspect that we're going to have to rediscover natural law and then begin to translate its implications into um, social uh, law uh, or positive law uh, as it's sometimes described. So uh, th this question like the mathematics question or more broadly the, the language question, uh, all of these are to some extent um, balls that have been tossed up in the air. And it uh, falls to us uh, to try to make sure that the whole thing doesn't collapse. Let me ask one more question here to elaborate on the main theme. CSDL holds that digital retrieves the scribal. And at 52 Living Ideas, we've been studying scribal by looking at Gospel of John, Bhagavad Gita, and Tao Te Ching, and it has been stunning to see that sensibility. And I think most modern people do not get that sensibility. If you're saying scribe, you know, digital re retrieve scribal, could you spend a little bit of time on talking about what the scribal sensibility is? Well, I think the most Im important thing that I would highlight about a scribal sensibility is that it is integral. So integral is a term denounce reductionism uh, and, and so forth. Uh, these all occurred uh, under electric conditions. And so it means that, that they were uh, subject uh, to an enormous amount of uh, potential error, speculation. And uh, even though uh, uh, individuals like Ken Wilber, uh, who is perhaps most associated with the uh, integralist uh, effort, at least in the circles that, that I encounter, uh, he has uh, professed to have uh, literally read everything and brought it all together in a synthesis, but that synthesis is, is not sensitive to many of the topics that we've been discussing. So uh, we are going to have to reintegrate all of these things. The trivium is not three separate activities. It is an integrated activity. Uh, George is, is, is quite right that we have uh, very much overemphasized, if you will, uh, the logical uh, component to this. Um, this. This might also be 
uh, the sort of thing that, that you would pick up from uh, Ilian, Ian McGilchrist as he uh, tries to localize the uh, logical uh, in the left hemisphere and uh, the analogical in the right hemisphere. He is a, uh, a brain, uh, he's, a, he's a neuropsychologist. So many people have noticed aspects of this, but the notion that the underlying technological environment encourages us to rethink all of these topics. The scribal sensibility, um, which covers a very large uh, stretch of time to be sure and has many uh, internal uh, divisions, nonetheless is unified in a, in a sense that print found itself in opposition. Uh, and so the dualism often associated with uh, Rene Descartes, uh, cogito ergo sum and beyond uh, is typically described as a uh, driving a wedge uh, between uh, the material and the spiritual. That is <clears throat> no longer gonna be tolerated. Um, one approach to this will be Aristotle's uh, hylomorphism. So the notion that the material uh, and the immaterial form are absolutely wed to each other, they are integrated with each other, it is something that it is going to need to be deeply grasped. One of the implications of this, of course, which, which we have uh, skirted uh, around the borders of, and we'll talk a bit more about this next week uh, in the Thinking Anew uh, third uh, lecture in the series, uh, is the retrieval of religion. Um, as an integrated uh, sensibility where both the material and the immaterial are, are seen as uh, interpenetrating each other. Uh, so I very much look forward uh, to seeing you all uh, next week. Um, this will be the thinking anew uh, session. Fred has some uh, thoughts he'd like to add on here. I'm, I'm sorry, Fred. Uh, Just a second, hold on. Let me go ahead and unmute Fred. Fred, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, in two weeks, right? Not yes, next I'm, week. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. The, the, two the, weeks. The, the two fingers. Thank you very much uh, for, for clarifying that. We had a scheduling conflict uh, next Sunday. So um, uh, the next the third in this lecture series will be two weeks from today. And we'll finish it up uh, with a discussion of the three spheres, East, West, and digital, four weeks uh, from today. I'm sorry. Two, two weeks from today is the third lecture. Three weeks from today is the final and fourth lecture. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. And thank you very much, uh, George and Adam, for, uh, for, for your comments. And um, we look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Thank Great. you. Thank you all.